Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for another edition of Texas Insider TV brought to you by the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers. I'm Jim Cardle. Mark Flaster has been a frequent guest of ours and today we're pleased to visit with him to talk about three things. The economic recovery after Hurricane Harvey in Houston and what is actually happening on the ground. Federal Reserve Chairman Janet Yellen's term expiring and what's going on to drive the stock market to record highs seemingly every day. We're pleased to be able to visit today with Mark Flaster, who's a bank and Wall Street analyst from New York City. Well, Mark Flaster from Wall Street and frequent Texas Insider guest and economic analyst, we appreciate you coming back in today. Well, uh, Jim, I, I always enjoy coming to visit you. Uh, the uh, traffic getting into Austin uh, continued to be a challenge, and so I have to give some uh, credit to the to the growth of the town uh, that's continuing to, to uh, show promise. You're, you're right, 159 people, they say, are moving into Austin every day, but let's just jump right into well, it. Well, some of them were in the line ahead of me in the parking lot, and that's why there wasn't a space. There you go, there you go. <laughs> a lot going on economically, though, and you were mentioning just a second ago uh, between the two of us here about how you've been traveling the state for the last couple days, a good part of this week, particularly in Houston. There's mm -hmm. been Hurricane Harvey, a lot of questions about how long it might take to recover or what some of the sh more short-term economic impacts are going to be. Tell us what you saw down in Houston. Okay, well, first of all, Jim, I, I'd like to take a second out of this conversation that we're having to make a, a statement. Okay. okay. Uh, the uh, New York Yankees lost the, the uh, the uh, end of the, their series, and the Astros uh, are now uh, involved in the, in the World Series, and, and uh, Joe Girardi got fired this morning, whatever. But I have to say that although I am a die-hard Yankee fan, and, uh, and, but since 1955, I've hated the Dodgers. And I have hated the Dodgers so much, I will go to my grave hating the Dodgers. <laughs> so I'm a, uh, a, I'll say I'm a, a Astros fan by... Uh, we'll say by uh, we'll say by default. Yes. And uh, I want everyone to know that I watch the games and I'm very excited and I hope the Astros pull it out. Good and choice. Good, good, good choice. Now you know uh, up one one. Uh, getting back to the question at hand, mm -hmm. uh, I was just in Houston and I was surprised uh, as I met uh, many of the bankers in Houston uh, that uh, the uh, devastation from uh, Hurricane Harvey. Uh, was not to be uh, uh, dismissed. It, it caused a lot of problems and a lot of people were, were displaced and, uh, and some of them lost their homes as a result of it. But the banks suffered very little or no uh, loan problems in terms of uh, credits being defaulted, in terms of um, uh, uh, payments being deferred. Um, their facilities, uh, for, oh, every facility was, was not impacted, personally, you know, in terms of, of mm -hmm. damage. Uh, but their people were lived in those zones, and their people were personally, uh, uh, or, uh, personally affected. And some of the bankers that I talked to uh, actually uh, put uh, their own money at, in their people's hands to help them. You're talking about their employees, the employees I guess. Yeah, em not their customers, their employees. Their employees. Interesting. Yeah, the, the customers. Uh, for the most part, for everyone told me that they, the customers, for the most part, uh, they they didn't suffer any problems. They're they're uh, they're mostly commercial lenders, and uh, um, that that was okay. What was not okay is their employees suffered. So they lost workers on some days. They had to go, you know, be there when the electrician or the the garbage man showed up, whatever it was. And uh, some of them have stepped up and actually provided support, which I thought was wonderful. So at that point, you're looking, I guess, a way to say it is more of an impact on residential Houston than perhaps on commercial on, businesses. On business. And so the, the Houston is back in business. I don't think it was ever out of business. I think the, the newspapers uh, uh, fanned the flame here. Um, when Katrina hit New Orleans, 25% of the residents of New Orleans didn't come back. You know where okay. they went? They went to Houston. Houston. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> but... In the in in uh, what we know right now after Hurricane Harvey is that nobody left, and even if their homes were all destroyed, they stayed around. And uh, another thing that's happened is that 
there was a uh, overbuilding uh, excess of, of, uh, of available space to live in, not so much single family homes, but uh, residential towers that were up being put up for rentals. Okay. And uh, uh, that was, has been available, and of course the supply has been now absorbed, and uh, maybe encouraged some other builders to step in and build some more, uh, which may bring it back the oversupply yeah. condition. But most important is that the, the, the housing availability was there and in place, and so uh, it afforded for a lot of people an opportunity, as I said, to stay in the city, to stay at work, uh, to continue their lives, and uh, deal with the, the problems at hand. But um, except for what the New York Times wrote, mm -hmm. um, People have gotten back to business. They've gone back. They're, 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 you know, we've gone through it. You know, the pool collapsed. The, the car got uh, swamped. You know, but, you know, that's life. Good insights there, folks. I want to thank you again for joining us for this edition of Texas Insider TV. We're visiting with economic and bank analyst across Texas, Mark Flaster from New York City. Mark, let's just jump in real quick because everybody's heard the stock market has been continuing. On a, on a roaring pace this year, but since you've been in in the last month, we've had U.S. manufacturing growing at its fastest pace in 13 years. We've had forecasts for holiday spending to be up 6% this December. Mm -hmm. Unemployment claims are down. The service sector is growing supposedly at a remarkable rate. Let's get into the economics in, in the stock market and the bond markets that you're an expert in. What's the mood of Wall Street and what's driving some of the, some of the economic indicators that you see? Well, if, I guess the first thing to say here is that Dow is, is challenging a next uh, uh, of, uh, of cross of another high bar of 3,000 is that we're sitting here at the 30th anniversary of the crash. And uh, at that oh, time, it's from the 1987, 1987 stock market crash, yes. And uh, at that time, the Dow was something around 1,500 or something below that. And uh, and so the Dow moved up uh, over a lot of years. And uh, remember, the Dow is only 20 stocks. And uh, of those 20 stocks, Good point. the uh, Dow Jones Index itself is valued by the most expensive stocks in that group. So if the expensive stock moves several points, it has more impact, like IBM the other day was up 12 points. Okay. Well, that had more impact than the Dow. Dow was over 200 for that day. Okay. It, was, it was IBM and Boeing who were driving it. Interesting. It wasn't you know, the, the list of other companies that, yes. that, uh, that are in that Dow. Um, so that's one thing to understand is the Dow index, which has become our um, uh, our regulator. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's what gets quoted in the news yeah, every our, evening. Our barometer of how the yes. market is doesn't mean the whole market is doing that. Now there's another index called the S&P, and that's much broader based. Now the S&P has improved too, and but not at the rate that the Dow has moved. Um, now within that, there's a couple of stocks that have just gone off the charts. Ten stocks, and it's in my book here. Okay. Uh, ten stocks represent almost 50% of the move in the Dow index. Really? 10 stocks. Okay. Facebook, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon, um, uh, uh, Google uh, probably Net is Google, the G. G, Netflix, and I can't remember the other one. Okay. But all the tech stocks that have been going stocks, through the they've roof. done X very, very well. Interesting. And, uh, and so they, they've uh, uh, continued to, to uh, be a, a monitor uh, of how well the market is doing because the tech sector is ballooning and, uh, and they seem to find new ways to, to expand it almost every, every day and, and there's a lot of challenges as well. But, uh, so outside of these technology companies having a, a overweighted impact, so to speak, what about the manufacturing well, and in, in the, the, in, in the... In the game plan, and I think there are two things that uh, people would probably put their finger on why the stock market is up. Okay. And the first one is going to be uh, what's going on in Washington, and I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, the other is uh, what's going on in business. Okay. And today, uh, large investment pools are, are buying a position in particular companies and are going to those companies and say that your company is very large 
and it has uh, a central focus uh, where you get the bulk of your revenues, and then you spread out in little places like a, like a, 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 a um, some some kind of uh, octopus, mm -hmm. and you've got businesses over here and businesses over there, and they tear away the time of the, the talent of your people who know how to do this, and you're trying to force them to go someplace else and start up a division that will match what you have over here. And so they're telling them, get rid of all that. Over diversification, Just perhaps. Stay, stay in, you know, mm -hmm. stay focused on what you do. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing companies selling a lot of divisions, and with that, uh, cutting back on uh, expenses, which is part of the result of that, but they're also having to lay off people. So when you look at the employment rate, which you haven't asked exactly directly, you look at the employment rate, is you see the, the um, unemployment index going down, but you don't see the employment rate going up. Mm -hmm. So the, the government you know, reports that we have a tight labor market. You don't have a tight labor market. I don't know what kind of market you have, but the, 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 the volume of people who are working has not increased. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's gone down. The participation rate continues to fall. Some of it has to do with aging population, but a lot has to do with the fact that the people who are being laid off are not finding new jobs, or if they're finding new jobs, they're somewhere different than what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is that from a, uh, a monitoring point of view, the unemployment rate continues to fall from 4.4 in the last report to 4.2 to this report. Maybe the next one gets to 3.7, I don't know, but it's going in that direction. Well, so you and I have talked before, Mark, about the so-called Trump bump. Right. Um, well, it's not We've so got cool. tax cuts certainly probably uh, impacting business decisions. There are economic signals about a growing economy, correct? Absolutely. And if you look at uh, how the Dow and as well, or the stock market as well as the bond markets reacted, uh, nobody expected that Donald Trump would su succeed in being president as he, uh, as he ran for that office. And up until that time, you had a stock market that was relatively flat during all the period of the Obama uh, rule, okay. and uh, the bond markets also stretched themselves somewhere around the 10-year bond as an index was somewhere around oh, 160 to 180, and the Fed was in there with the interest rates down at zero, and then they you know, she started to push them up a little bit. But and interest rates have been historically low, which would drive economic well, the, I, the whole idea yeah. was that if we dropped into uh, of, uh, of Bernanke's program of quantitative easing, which was then embraced by uh, Mario Draghi in, uh, in, in, uh, in Europe, in yeah. Europe with the, uh, the ECB, as well as uh, AB in, uh, in Japan, and they all did the same thing. And the results have been pretty much the same. Money declined. Um, it hurt the, those that were... Uh, dependent on using, on, on living on that money because there was no, no uh, decline in the interest that was earned, and um, building didn't take off, business didn't take off. Um, so, so now so you've got the failed, prospect of tax cuts, yeah, though. So certainly, so it's a failed strategy. So what you have now is you have the one element that I just mentioned, and you have uh, when Trump came in, he says, "Look, I says I'm going to get rid of a lot of you know things that were the social uh, and and, and uh, environmental." Uh, Political, uh, political correctness, there's focus. the EPA cutting regulations. And so yes. I'm going to get rid of all that and I'm going to get in here and, and put this country on its proper feet and we're going to go forward and rather than backward, which Obama was always backward. Okay? And uh, uh, the immediate reaction was an improvement in the expectation of the, the, the markets. Uh, when he failed with the ACA, uh, markets took a pause. Obamacare is what you're talking about, Affordable and, Care uh, Act. Yeah. Now, uh, with the budget being approved by both the House and the Senate, which doesn't have to have the president's signature, and uh, the tax bill, which everyone said as it uh, was first proposed, what that uh, that was a dead letter, and uh, you know just to be brushed that away. Well, they're now starting to believe this this is going to happen, or something will happen, mm -hmm. and the market is generating a lot of promise on the expectation, and it's anybody's view what might happen, but. People are taking a piece of it and said, that's good for me if it happens, and they're willing to invest. Now, at the same time, money is coming out of the market because it's moved so much, and many professional money managers are taking some money off the table and saying that uh, we, we want to be 
you know, a, a little cautious here. We want to stay in the market, then we see it continuing as, as it continues to rise. But if something happens, and it happens as dramatically as it happened before, uh, or at one uh, earlier time, we're not as, as, as exposed. Now, so you're talking about, just to clarify, you're talking, or, or we're talking here about the economic growth across the country being one indicator and factor, but you're talking specifically about the stock market and money managers money taking management. their money off now the, the table. Now, the stock market is, does not represent the country. Yes. Okay? It has nothing to do with uh, business, uh, 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 the country's uh, uh, activity. Uh, it, it's completely uh, another another phase, another function. As uh, many people say, it's more an indicator of future potential. Well, it could earnings. be that, but I'll just take an example here. The, the motor companies. Okay? Mm -hmm. I, I know I've mentioned this before. Uh, they don't have a product. U.S. motor companies don't have a product they can sell. They build the cars, and they end up selling to the use to the uh, uh, rental c companies, which then use them and then put them back in the used car lots. Now. Ford Motor Company and General Motors. General Motors is bankrupt. They've been through bankruptcy. They, st they don't have a product. They're laying 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people off. They're closing plants that produce their, their cars. The only thing they can sell is uh, the, the, uh, um, the big truck there. What do you call it? Uh, uh, well, the Toyota Tundra and the no, Silverado no, the, the, and what is, the, the Ram. The, what's the big thing that, uh, that uh, everyone drives around in? And uh, Ford can only sell their truck, the F-150 truck, which is a very successful product. SUVs you're talking yeah, about, but, probably. But they, uh, that, and that's another product that it, it hit people. People are more interested in, in the space they provide. They like to be higher up on the road so they can see better. Um, they like the cargo capacity. Uh, they give up some of the ride, but they're willing to accept that. Uh -huh. uh, but, uh, but with gasoline prices lower, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, it, it, submissibility of the SUV has been accepted that uh, it, it's not, it, it, it burns more gas, but the gas is cheaper, so you know the dollars kind of work out the same. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at uh, why has Ford Motors Company uh, stock gone up so well and, and the General Motors stock, it's because the new idea is uh, driven by maybe Mr. Musk or maybe some others, but artificial intelligence. So they're going to put artificial intelligence in the car, and you're going to be a passenger, and some electronic bug is going to drive it. And uh, both companies are, and wall companies, are very active trying to develop and design a, a, uh, an element that will a be able to do this and be safe. It'll be able to understand what's going on around it and be safe. Now, the, jet, the Chinese have put an uh, awful lot of effort into this. And at the rate it's going, they're probably going to have a car that uh, you know, we would say that would be uh, uh, automated on itself to drive. Now, whether anybody will drive it is another question. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a long way to go. Uh, uh, current estimates say that uh, the current automobile will probably st still be around here till 2035. Well, so. speaking of questions, I want to move to one more subject if I can before sure. we let you go. And folks, Thanks again for joining us for this edition of Texas Insider TV. We're visiting with bank and financial analyst Mark Flaster from New York City. Mark, one final thing here would be the Federal Reserve Chairmanship. Mm -hmm. Janet Yellen is the current chairman. Her term expires. President Trump's been out this week mentioning a name here for replacement, a name there. What do you see or what are you hearing as potential there, and is it impacting the markets? Well, what um, what will it do to this economic? Uh, there's, there's five people that are in the running: uh, um, Jerome Powell, uh, Jim Taylor, uh, Ken Warsh, uh, Gary Cohn, and Janet Yellen. Okay. And Janet's the current uh, uh, member, uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, and. Uh, uh, she's got a board in the, what they call the, the uh, Federal Open Market Committee yes. uh, that uh, uh, helps her uh, design and develop uh, uh, economic policy or, or interest rate policy as the Federal Reserve is uh, allowed. Now remember, the Federal Reserve a number of years ago was given a mandate that they would on, not only control interest rates, but they would improve employment. Now the last time I looked, the Federal Reserve was not the employer of last resort. 
So and they don't have the ability to go out and hire people either per se. So, so you know, I said that that part has to be taken away. And there's some movement in the Congress uh, as part of all these other things because you didn't have an administration that was so uh, let's say uh, so interested uh, before in doing anything that uh, would change what had been put in place. You may have had things added on, uh, especially during the uh, Obama administration, but you didn't have change. It just became more burdensome, okay. more regulations, more, more uh, restrictions, and more monitors, especially in the banking industry with the Dodd-Frank okay. and the CFPB. So um, that, that's just one element, that, that's a big part of it. But each of these people I've mentioned have, uh, a, we'll say, a different soapbox to stand on, and some of them uh, have a little bit more uh, conversation that says they're going to be interested in raising interest rates right away. Others say uh, that uh, they, they want to, like Janet Yellen, that, oh, well, well, this is what I want to do, but I'm not ready to do it unless certain things appear to be happening. What's important in all this is that the requirement is that inflation be at 2% or better which it hasn't been for the last year or more, or no, several years. And inflation does not exist. It's not under the desk. It's not in my pocket. It's not in this room. It's not in, outside in Austin. It's not in Texas. It's nowhere. It's nowhere in the world. Really? And they don't understand that. Mm -hmm. So they keep on threatening that they're going to raise interest rates because inflation, that ugly villain that's wandering around here somewhere, is hiding and we aren't sure it's hiding, but we just haven't found the right place it's hiding in. Mm -hmm. But it will emerge, and when we see it, we're going to grab hold of it. Yeah. And we'll have it, and then we can go forward with our interest rate policy. Interesting. So it's a boogeyman of sorts, borrowing trouble, is what you're saying. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the, at some point, uh, they, they, they may recognize this, because they've had a couple of discussions that... Uh, that they, they don't understand how inflation continues to stay low, and it's worldwide, and, uh, um, and yet their forecasts and all their models say it, it should be, you know, very, very uh, evident. Now, I know why there's no inflation, and you know why there's no inflation. It's called foreign trade, and our president doesn't understand that. Mm -hmm. So all the credit you want to give to what the, the Trumpster is doing, you have to recognize that he's sort of in another zone as far as things uh, relate to the economy. And uh, uh, the, uh, one of his uh, uh, proposals is that uh, we reverse some of the trade uh, agreements, NAFTA for being one of them particularly, that's well known here in, in Texas. And uh, uh, this will, uh, NAFTA was very helpful in improving the opportunity for the U.S. here and those abroad there to benefit from the cheapest resource of production and, uh, and cost. If you look at um, a company like uh, Japan, Japan has a big problem, okay? Japan's problem is that, one, they have no people to work in the factories. So there are no people working in the factories. And Japan has a very narrow policy for, import, for immigration. In fact, anywhere you go in Japan, you're unlikely to see anybody who's not Japanese. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so where do they produce their automobiles that we're all driving? Well, Toyota plant, you know, in uh, San Antonio, uh, the uh, Mexico. All Mercedes Benz are built in Mexico, just about. Okay? Interesting. And so, all these countries are making products, and those products are cheaper in many cases than we could, but we make a lot of things that are cheaper than they could do, like, like airplanes. I mean, we're the cheapest guy in the world for airplanes. But a lot of the parts that go into the airplane came from some other country. Mm -hmm. So we got assembled here, and it's more valuable here in terms of our expertise, our ability to manufacture. Uh, another piece of the equation is, is, uh, is the, the talent of the worker. And uh, that's one of the reasons why all these companies report that they, they're having trouble hiring people. It's not that there's fewer people available to hire because there's so much of them employed. It's that there's no one has the skill. Mm -hmm. Now, you want to you wanna fix something? Get a plumber, okay? Try to get a plumber. Yeah. Try to get a plumber that's under 50 years old. And under $100 an hour. Well, forget about that. I mean, they don't exist. 
It's yeah. not a trade that anybody has picked up in the younger sector that wants to be a plumber. I don't do that. Dirty, uh, blue jeans that are, you know, I said. So it's a trade that we'll say is dying, uh, hasn't, we, but we need it, okay? Uh, there, there's now some schools, universities, that are starting a apprenticeship program in the school. So what they're doing in the school is teaching you a, a vocational trade that you can then go out and be a plumber's assistant so you can learn yeah. the trade. Just because there's so many people that are not at that level of education that they can go off and, and build you know, uh, um, artificial intelligence models. Right. Well, Mark Flaster, from um, your travels across the state, we're going to have to leave it there with the plumbing industry, okay. so to speak. But appreciate your input and look forward to having you back. Well, thank you very much, and go Astros. <laughs> you go. Folks, we appreciate you joining us for another edition of Texas Insider TV. I'm Jim Cardle. You're either an insider or you're not. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.